And it was Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And this video applies to anyone who's doing any type of ortho. It doesn't matter if you're doing kids only, teens only, adults only. Habits happen. And habits often happen unconsciously, subconsciously. Um, and patients often don't know they're doing it. And they often have a lot of shame around them. So they may not even tell you they're doing it unless you like press and point it out. So I want to kind of just make some awareness as to what I look for when I'm looking for habits. Every single patient, potential set of records is a potential habit patient. And if there's any type of habit, your case will be unpredictable, if not impossible, and or could do damage if you treatment planned it the wrong way. And sometimes you can't even take that case at that moment. And that's why I really hesitate to have you guys just grabbing deposits on every case because sometimes it's just too early to start a case. They need to get the habit identified and eliminated first. So let's talk about what I'm looking for in records. Um, so different types of habits. Let's name all the different types of habits. Obviously, these are the three most common. You've got your tongue thrust. You've got your thumb sucking, you got your finger sucking, but we also have any foreign object that goes in the mouth is a habit. Fingers, thumbs, stuffed animals, blankies, pens, pencils, nails. Um, those are probably the main ones that you'll see, um, but there's people get really creative with their habits. So they bite on t-shirts, they bite on plastic. My daughter used to bite on her swim goggles incessantly for hours and hours, and it started to cause a little bit of an open bite. Um, these things happen. Um, so those are the ones with foreign object. Then we've got the ones with the tongue. So the tongue is its own habit. And this is actually sometimes the worst habit because it happens more than often at nighttime. Um, and the patient has no idea that they're doing it. They may not have a tongue thrust during the day, but they might have one at night. And it doesn't necessarily have to be anterior. It can be lateral as well. So, um, and sometimes there's nothing they can do about this. If the tether is too tight on the bottom of the tongue, it can't go up into the parking garage. It has to go forward when it swallows to create an airway seal. So this is not the patient's fault. They can't just stop it. And putting in a crib is not gonna stop it in most circumstances. You have to do the stretching and do the trimming. And not just the trimming, you have to do the stretching and the trimming, otherwise it's gonna grow back. So um, definitely you need to learn to identify it. Now there's things that I'm gonna see in the presentation of the incisors, not only in the mouth, but also in a cephalometric x-ray. That's why a cephalometric x-ray is amazing. You can show me a ceph and I can be like, there's a habit. Um, now, sometimes over time, the more a habit happens, the more the jaw bones are gonna grow in the wrong direction. In that case, just breaking the habit isn't gonna fix the problem. In a maybe four and under, five and under, breaking the habit is gonna fix the problem spontaneously, assuming that there's no tongue tether issue or no massive airway issue, like blocking the airway, like tonsils or adenoids. If it's just a foreign object, get rid of the object, habit usually the issue from the habit usually spontaneously resolves in six to 12 months. Um, in an older patient over age, once the permanent teeth start to come in, that doesn't happen spontaneously. Now we often need to do some ortho. In a patient that's done growing, that doesn't happen spontaneously, even with ortho, you're gonna have to actually do some surgery or some major oral malfunctional intervention. And by surgery, it might involve releases it doesn't have to be jaw surgery, it might be soft tissue surgery. But this is gonna to add to the cost of the treatment and it's gonna be likely a referral someplace else first, get that problem fixed for six to 12 months, then come back to ortho to finish the ortho. So you have to kind of think of the physics of this. If we're putting a thumb in there, the top teeth are gonna move forward, the lower teeth are gonna move back. It depends on how they're sucking and what they're sucking, the size of the sucking. So something like this is more like a tongue thrust because all the incisors are forward, whereas a, a thumb sucking will have the lower incisors retroclined. So it does help to have that conversation. Anytime you see like a weird open bite or even just weird flared incisors, um, it does help to have that conversation. Hey, does anything go in your mouth that isn't food? You know, just asking because I noticed that your incisors are a little bit flared and this usually happens when something happens without food. So, and you just rattle them off, you know. Um, usually you can see it in their face. They're not expecting that question. And just say, you know, I'm concerned because 
this is going to be harder or even impossible for me to fix unless I know the source of what's causing this problem. Now, if they really, if you see something and you really believe there's something weird and they're not fessing up to it, some of them stuff can happen subconsciously. Like I said, they can be sleeping and sucking on stuff. It happens. And don't think that only kids suck their thumb. I've had adults that have, when I have asked this question, I've fully fessed up at 60, 70, 80 to sucking their thumb in the closet under the sheets at night when they're upset, when they're stressed. It's a comfort. It's a coping technique. It happens. You know, it's just like alcohol or drugs, you know, people have their coping techniques and they're not going to freely give you that information unless you, <laughs> unless you dig into it a little bit. So, um, definitely learn to see the signs, definitely ask. And if you can't figure it out and you have that icky feeling that there's a habit going on, that's when you get the OMT, the oral myofunctional therapist involved. They will look and see if it's more of an issue with the anatomy or with that, with the tongue doing weird things. They're really good at that or the, even the airway. They're going to catch all that. And then as needed, the patient may need a release, they may need exercises, they may need to go to ENT for a surgery before they even consider orthodontics. Again, I'm gonna say this one more time, especially in adults, but even more in non-growing teens, and even somewhat in kids who are growing, if you start the ortho first before getting rid of the habit, 100% you will have an unpredictable outcome, possibly an impossible outcome, possibly a damaging outcome, as well as when you try to retain it, I don't care if you do bonded retainers or not, it will not retain. It will relapse. The patient will be furious and you will have wasted a lot of money and a lot of time. And if you're the one that missed the habit, guess what? It's on you. You're retreating and or refunding, if not worse. So you have to not rush this. And too many times I have doctors that just, well, they already put a deposit down. Okay, well, we missed the habit, you know? It is what it is. So they can still do their ortho, but they gotta do other stuff first. But that does add to the cost unless you have OMT in your office. You know, you're gonna have to outsource that. You're gonna have, have to outsource to a periodontist. You're gonna have to outsource to an ENT. So that's why I wanna get you guys all trained up on identifying habits. All right, I think I've talked enough about it, but you guys get the idea of how passionate I am about this. All right, thanks.